get credit. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Serious Computer Security Seminar here at Purdue University. Our speaker today is Dr. Bilal Shabaro. He is a postdoctoral researcher here working with Professor Elisa Bertino. He's from the University of New Mexico. His topic today is, you are anonymous, then you must be lucky. It's a discussion about attacks on anonymity in online environments. Bilal? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and um, I'm really excited to share my knowledge uh, about uh, the security of anonymity networks that are available nowadays. Um, so all of us go on the internet pretty much every day, and we visit uh, like tens to hundreds of uh, websites every day. How would you feel if there's somebody standing over your shoulder and watching all your traffic and seeing all the websites you've been visiting? So. It's, it's definitely an annoying thing. How many website, how many less websites would you be visiting? 10%, 20%, 50%, 100%, who knows? It's just definitely something not comfortable to know that there's somebody watching your traffic and, um, and can see what is the source of, uh, wh where's all this tra uh, internet traffic going through. So, in fact, we live in a digital age where we are now capable of doing a lot of things online. For example, you do uh, online banking, you do purchases online, you, we file our um, tax returns online. A lot of this sensitive information and data is just transferred over the internet. So data is kind of more public now than private than when we used to have it. It's just like on the paper and just going somewhere else. Uh, to a certain place, now it's, we're just putting it on the net, or we're sending it to a certain place, but who knows what happens in the middle. And definitely, uh, all this kind of sort of sensitive information that's been transferred over the internet, encryption solves a big, uh, is a big deal in here because it solves a big problem. Okay, so it's encrypting, all the, the encrypt encryption is a solution that is taking care of somebody in the middle looking at this uh, data. But the question is that encryption is not taken care of. We cannot encrypt the IP address. We cannot encrypt the source of where this data is leaving and going to and coming back. Because if we encrypt that, we're not going to be able to reroute, right? We're, gonna, we're not going to be able to do the routing to, to send it and receive uh, back data uh, like that. So this is where anonymous networks come in place. But anonymous networks do not encrypt as much as they hide your IP address. So you can still reroute and go back and forth, send data to website, websites, receive some information back, but nobody would know what's the source of this connection that's happening. The thing is, is the internet a good place to be paranoid? Indeed, because since you're using these internet services, you're connecting, you're using routers to connect to your Jump, uh, your, your internet traffic is going from one hub to another to another. Anyone in the middle can watch all this information. If it's encrypted, not encrypted, we're going to discuss how this can limit the, uh, the, somebody who's watching over your internet or not. Um, who uses anonymity? Um, anybody uh, interested in hiding his IP address and doesn't want to show the activity or any possible someone who's watching over your uh, internet traffic to, uh, to be able to see all this traffic. So we got uh, a lot of people just for personal reasons, just uh, use anonymous networks. Uh, military use anonymous networks for their, uh, their commands. There's a lot of human rights, especially in, um, in countries that has um, like in sensitive and strict regimes that they, are, they don't, uh, they need like, really uh, to protect their human rights and they need to publish stuff that nobody would know where the source of these. Um, activists, law enforcement, um, doing some investigations, and mainly when you go to public, um, public places that offer internet like internet cafes and um, um, hotspots and libraries, you don't know who's the ISP, you don't know who's providing you with the internet, you don't know or why should you trust the one who's giving you this free internet, he might be recording all the traffic and stuff like that. So um, I just want to ask, like, how many of you uses anonymous networks at least once per day? How many uses once per week? Once per month? 
All right, so it seems um, I'm more than happy today to talk about this. I'm really glad that um, I can introduce these concepts today and, and, and also uh, discuss are, are they secure or not, and this is really important to know. So um, this is an example or a list of uh, anonymous networks that are available online. That's a small list. There's a lot more. Um, uh, these, uh, network, uh, these anonymous networks are built uh, either through, through different technologies, some of them through peer-to-peer, -peer, P2P proxies, VPNs, uh, virtual machines. So each one designed his anonymous network service to be, uh, as the way they see it, to be very helpful and very, uh, uh, very strong for, to, to protect the users. So, um, I'm going to focus on one uh, of the most popular um, anonymous network out there, which is TOR. It stands for the Onion uh, Router. It's a second generation Onion Routing uh, network. The, um, the word Onion, you can you can, I'm going to just explain it in a bit. Why is it called Onion? What's the Onion and the, and the network doing? Um, it's, de it's developed by Roger Dingledine and Nick Matheson and uh, Paul Syverson. Uh, First time it was running in October 2003. It's free. It's awesome that it's open source. We can do a lot of uh, research on it. And also it's open source for people who are want to real, see really what's happening in there for matter of trust. Um, uh, we've seen over 250,000 relays and users. Uh, sorry, users, not relays, because that's and thousands of relays. Um, the thing about Tor, which is an example of an anonymous network, that it's limitation that it works only on TCP streams. So what happens when I have an application that uses uh, that uh, uses UDP only? Uh, the Tor will try to to change it to change its traffic to uh, TCP so that it can support it. Else, it has to go through UDP, and UD and, and Tor does not protect you from that. Does not uh, support UDP uh, streams. So how exactly Tor works and why it's really one of the most powerful and interesting anonymous networks out there and where the word onion comes from and what is it about. So if you look at the client, this client is interested in connecting to the, uh, to the, to the web server down there, okay, but anonymously. So he doesn't, want, he doesn't want to tell the web server, that's me, that's my IP address. How do we hide it? In fact, Tor works in the following way. Tor let any client interested in, um, in, in connecting through anonymous network to go, to, to th of course, to the Tor anonymous network to connect to a directory server. A directory server has IP addresses of all the Onion routers. And Onion routers are a set of computers. Any one of us can set his computer to be an Onion router to be part of this Tor network. So for every connection, when this client wants to connect to the web server, he has to pick three Onion routers from the directory server. Okay, three computers. Um, now, after, I, after the client picks these three computers, he exchanges a symmetric key between the client and each of these computers. So that's why you see uh, three keys on top of this uh, client. And when it's time for the client to be ready to send data out to the uh, web server, it encrypts its request with three layers of uh, encryption based on these three keys that it exchanged with these three uh, three computers. And again, I'm going to refer to these computers from now on by ORs or Onion routers. So the data packet that is sent is encrypted with three la layers. That's the Onion. It looks like an Onion now. Okay, and it goes first to the OR1, to the first OR, Onion router. This Onion router receives it, and he knows the outermost uh, encryption layer. He knows how to decrypt it because it's encrypted, the outermost encrypted by the, the key that was exchanged between him and the client. So it unwraps this request, unwrapping the onion, and then it will realize, okay, now I see an, an IP address of OR2 that I have to send it to. So OR1 forwards that packet to OR2. OR2 would take a look at it, it was like, all right, I know how to decrypt that outermost uh, layer. It unwraps it, decrypts it, and see the IP address of OR3 that forwards it to OR3, and then finally OR3 will get it with only one layer of encryption. It will remove that layer and send it to the web server. So you can see that 
request has been sent to the web server without any encryption. Now, the web server will look at it. He will know that this request came from OR3 and not from the client. So Tor succeeded in here. The web server does not know that the client is the source of this request, but it knows that the source of this request is OR3. Now, let's look at it from the, other, from the other side. The web server wants to reply back to the client, to respond back to that request. He will send it back to OR3. OR3 will encrypt it with its one layer of encryption and send it to OR2. OR2 will add another layer of encryption and send it to OR1. And OR1 will add the final layer of encryption and give it to the client. The client knows all these uh, keys that can decrypt the whole thing and you can get the request. So this is, looks perfect, looks anonymous, looks secure, looks really uh, strong. The, the web server has no idea who the, um, the client is. But one last thing before I move on is that OR1 only knows two IP addresses. It knows the IP address of the client and knows the IP address of OR2. OR2 knows only two IP addresses. He knows, uh, OR2 knows the IP address of OR1 and knows the IP address of OR3. Similarly, uh, similarly I, uh, OR3 knows the IP address of OR2 and the web server. So none of them, and that's the goal of, uh, of Tor, that no single relay knows everything. Only the one before and the one after. Now, um, where the encryption happens here? Absolutely, we specified that the encryption is happening between, uh, between the client all the way to OR3. But what happens to the link that's between OR3 and the web server? That Tor does not encrypt it for you. That it's depending on the user itself. If you're using HTTPS, then yes, it's encrypted. It's like you're connecting directly. It's totally up to you. And definitely we advise you that any, uh, any website you're connected to and you're using, uh, you're sending back and forth some sensitive information like, uh, like logging in or, um, or, or you're doing some online uh, banking transaction, etc. definitely check that it's HTTPS or it's definitely not secure. Um, so Tor does not encrypt all the traffic. It encrypts the traffic from the client to the third Onion router, and then from the third to the, uh, uh, to the, to the web server, it's up to you. Um, there, Tor also offers something called bridges. So in some countries where there's a, a, a firewall and all the connection does not allow you to go out, okay, this directory server this directory server that contains all the IP addresses of the Onion routers, okay, is public. Anybody can look and see all these IP addresses. For example, if I look here, if the web server wants to know if this connection coming from a real client or from a Tor network, he'll be able to know. He will get all the list of the IP addresses in the directory server. He'll see each request coming from which IP address. If one of them matches, it's coming from Tor. An example, Wikipedia. Wikipedia will not allow you to uh, modify its content if you're, connect, if you're connected through Tor. It doesn't want anonymous people to go inside and modify the content of, uh, of, of Wikipedia articles. So um, if, if also there's a firewall in a country that does not allow you um, to use anonymous networks, Tor offers you things called bridges. Bridges are computers like ORs, exactly like ORs, but the only difference is that they are not public. So you have to contact Tor, tell Tor I need bridges. They will give you bridges. They will give you only you need a bridge for that first um, for set OR. So OR1 will not be uh, public. It will be um, not known. And then it goes from there to OR2 to OR3. So you can bypass the firewall. Also, Tor um, uh, offers you hidden services. And that's, I'm going to postpone discussing about that. In, like, in the next uh, four slides, uh, we can discuss this in detail and what is exactly hidden services. So far, it sounds good. It sounds really a great tool. Everybody want to go home and try it. And it's free. It's very easy to install. And I would like to just go there, connect, and, and go check my IP address. And I'll find, whoa, this is not my IP address. The first time I tried it, I put google.com, and I got German version of google.com, so it, it saw that my IP address is in Germany, which is 
uh, which is that means Tor is working. I'm anonymous. Um, there's a because it's famous because it's really cool. Any flaw, any um, any mistake in the programming, any uh, any flaw in this program is considered an attack. And an attack, the purpose of the attack to unhide the IP address that you were hiding. So to know the break to break the anonymity of Tor. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of attacks. I'm going to discuss some of them. Um, and there's a lot also of defenses by the Tor people, which they're doing really good. The um, one of the example of uh, attacks, we have the traffic confirmation attack. And um, in this way, the adversary is looking at, the adversary is trying to look at OR1 and OR3. The Tor people says, if, if a malicious attacker was able to control OR1 and OR3, then you are not anonymous. Let's go back a little bit. What happens if an at we have an attacker at OR1? It's fine because the attacker will know the IP address of the client, but will not know where this is going, to which web server is going. So he knows one piece of inf information which is useless. If attacker is OR2, he will also know nothing because that data packet is encrypted. He will know that the IP address before is OR1 and then OR3, nothing use uh, useful. Same thing if the attacker is in OR3, he will only know that some client in the world is trying to contact to, to the web, this web server, but I don't know who he is. What if an attacker was able to control OR1 and OR3? He will see the traffic coming to OR1. He will know the IP address of the client. He will see the traffic that's going to, um, to the web server. So he knows this web server has been contacting, contacted. And now, simple math, not simple math, it's really good math, hard math and some statistical methods will be able to know to do pattern matching and say, okay, this pattern matches with this pattern, that's the same uh, connection. And thus I know that this client, that attacker knows that this client is connected to this web server. So these are examples of traffic confirmation attacks. Um, autonomous systems awareness and Tor path selection deals with I don't need to be in the same uh, to, to, for the attacker to be in the uh, to be the first node and the third node at the same time. In other words, if if they if if the first if if the client and the web server are in the same uh, in the same network, so I can watch the traffic coming out from the client and I can watch the traffic coming inside uh, into the web server. That is sufficient enough. So if we look back at it. So the first attack was attacking OR1 and OR3 at the same time. Now I'm looking at the link between the client and OR1 and the link between uh, the OR3 and the web server. If the client and the web server both are in the same network, I can watch the traffic in and out. I'll be able also to do the um, pattern matching and figure out what's happening and who's connected to what. So these are a couple attacks um, that, uh, that breaks the anonymity of Tor. Other attacks like denial of service um, attacks. These attacks, um, we can imagine the, the following scenario. A malicious attacker offers, like, like any user, offers most of his computers to be relays, onion routers. Anybody can do that, simple configuration, you'll be that. But before doing that, he will try to be the client and contact a lot of web servers and try to make all the circuits and all the, uh, the, 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 the onion routers in the middle very busy with downloading a lot of stuff. So he'll really may be able to achieve that, the, uh, that all the onion routers are really busy downloading his thing, his, his blog things. And then he offers a lot of malicious nodes to the onion router. So all these new connections that are coming um, into the uh, to the Tor network and asking for connection, it's very likely that they will pick up some of his malicious notes that he offered because those are kind of free and the others he kind of made them, he made them very busy, okay? So what happens is they picked up his malicious node, he can do all the math we were talking about, we can, he can do uh, pattern matching, timing analysis, and he can be able to tell who's connected to what and the user will not be able to know if he's connected to a malicious node or not, and thus this attack is called packet spinning attack. 
Um, other attacks are related to the website fingerprinting. We've heard a lot about, I don't want to know, I don't need to know the address of the website you're connected into. All I need to know is the pattern that this website behaves. For example, I take a website, I see if I request that thing from that website, how many responses I'm gonna get. Uh, so you do, re the, so every website or most websites can, can retrieve a pattern. This is how this website will behave if I request information from it. So, if an adversary just watches this pattern, he will tell what website you've been connected to. So things get more interesting here. Because instead of watching the traffic from both ends, from the client end and from the web server end, now I can watch it only from the client end and watch for a certain pattern, take that pattern and match it with websites that I already have saved their patterns, and I can know which website you actually connected to. So this is kind of just like from one side. We don't have to access both sides. Now Tor is, has a defense against that, which is by fixing the cell size that is uh, going through its network. The cell size is 512 uh, bytes. So when you, send, uh, when you send a request to a, web, uh, to a website, they're all going, the cells are going 512, 512, 512, 512. While before, the, that attack was based on how big, the, how big these packets are going and coming back and I can know from their sizes. So Tor solved this problem by having a fixed size cells. But some attacks that are based on time, quantity, direction of the traffic were still able, even with this 512 fixed size cell, will still be able to find patterns through, um, as I mentioned, time, quantity, and direction that could work on Tor. The recent defense that Tor made is by doing um, HTTP pipelining. And HTTP pipelining means that I can send as many packets as I want, and I don't have to wait until one that responds back so I can send the other. I can just send a bunch of requests, and I get back a bunch of responses, so to, to kind of disturb the pattern that I send one, two, three, you get me one, two, and then I send you four, five, you get me three, four, five. So uh, it kind of disturbs the pattern. You can send one, two, three, four, five, and you get back one, two, three, four, five. So um, just website fingerprinting, I think, to keep in mind uh, that, uh, that it's, it's one of the ways that try to break your anonymity and Tor is helping in that. Um, there's also um, attacks related to the browser. Um, have you heard of Panopticlick? All right, I, I, I'm going to show you Panopticlick really quick here. Um, Panopticlick, that's the website, the URL up there. If you just try it, everyone on his computer, um, it's showing you how unique your IP address is. In other words, it's showing you, can I detect that it is you without knowing your IP address? So let's say I'm connecting through Tor, I'm connected to a website, that website does not know my IP address. Is there any other pieces of, piece of information that can know it's me without knowing my IP address? I'm slowing a little bit down because I'm seeing people typing it, want to try it. <laughs> Go ahead. I execute it on my machine and look what information it revealed. All this information you see here is everything about, uh, all the information that any website can read from my browser. Examples, we have the user agent. I'm using Mozilla on a Macintosh, on a Mac. Um, all this information, the Chrome, the Virgin, the Virgin, the, uh, the, all the plugins and their version, like um, the Adobe XML, the Flash in here, JavaScript, all the plugins and with the Virgin, as well as the time zone, the screen size and color depth, all these details, system fonts, all the system fonts. So the question is, how many computers have exactly the same configuration as the one I have here? The answer is up there. It tells you that my computer, or my browser, sorry, not computer, my browser is unique among 2.5 million computers <coughs> in the world, those that have been tested. So. So now with this information and without knowing my IP address, if I connect to certain websites that do these tests, 
they will know, hey, it's me. That's, that's, that's you who were connected before and after and everywhere you go, from school, home, anonymity network, all, travel all over the world, it's you, the same person. We know. So no need to know your IP address. So this is something to keep in mind. So um, OK. So um, this is an example of browser attacks. They can take your plugin details, browser characteristics, fonts, depth, uh, color depth, etc., and window size, everything to know that these are pieces of information that I know that it's you. Um, other examples of browser attacks is some websites have Flash, Java, ActiveX controls. These, some of them, some of these, are not, do not necessarily use the browser proxy. And when I say browser proxy, is that they're not using Tor because Tor, the way it protects your uh, browsing, the way it protects your browser from connecting, uh, the way from con to, co to allow you to connect anonymously, they use a proxy. But some some uh, components of the website do not use this proxy. They bypass it. So your website is connected anonymously to the web server, but some parts of the website are connected directly, it's bypassing the whole Tor network. And then if you look at these pieces and you get the real IP address, you know that, hey, this is the guy, same guy, same time, same everything. It's the same guy, but all this traffic that came through TCP or the website is anonymous, but that one is not. So kind of, of course, you broke up the anonymity. Um, more interesting attack is the JavaScript attack. And the JavaScript attack uh, allows, um, allows the adversary to have an anonymous uh, sorry, not anonymous, a, a malicious web server. In other words, the web server, whenever, uh, <coughs> sorry, I mean the um, malicious uh, OR3, the onion router, the third, not the web server. So what it does, if this is called the exit node, and a malicious who has his exit node, the OR3, can have a JavaScript that can point his traffic to another server while it's connecting you to the uh, web server. Okay, so a client connects through Tor, he arrives at OR3, OR3 has a JavaScript code that can point your traffic to another server that is logging your information, that is logging some traffic patterns, etc., and is giving you the information that you want to connect to the web server so you don't feel there's any danger. Later on, that same client, because the, this whole network is rebuilt, this whole circuit is rebuilt every 10 minutes, that's the design of Tor by default, happens to be the OR1. If later on it happens to be the OR1 and he's still recording your, uh, your, uh, your and that logging server has still been recording and it happened that you left that website open and you connect it again to a different circuit and it happens to be the enter one, he knows now your IP address and that's still logging into that logging server and he'll be able to know that, hey, it's you, the same person. So in other words, the malicious attacker doesn't have to be OR1 and OR3 at the same time. He can do it. He can be OR3 at one time. He can be OR1 at, at another time. And he can match these later on. Um, uh, this is just an example of uh, browser attacks. So we've seen um, website fingerprinting attacks, browser attacks, denial of service attacks, and other attacks. Now, one thing I promised uh, to um, discuss here is Tor Hidden Services. Tor Hidden Services is another uh, service by Tor that allows web servers to be anonymous. So we're not protecting the client at the moment. They are not protecting the client. They're protecting the web server itself. So if somebody has content and want to put it on a web server and provide it to everybody, OK? All he has to do, uh, and he doesn't want to, to, to identify himself, he doesn't want to give the IP address to everybody, all he does, he, he configures this web server to connect through Tor. In other words, Tor will give you a domain name, which is, ends up with .onion, if you've seen those on, the web, uh, on some websites, .onion, and that domain name, if you connect to it, Tor connects you to it, but you cannot tell the IP address of the contents of this, um, of this uh, website. How does this work? Um, first of all, you configure your computer as a hidden server. You put all the contents that you want to publish to everybody. And you, um, 
look in the Tor network, you want to find a computer that will accept you as an introduction point. And that is any computer on the, uh, on the uh, Tor network that accepts to introduce your services to the network. Because, of course, you don't want to introduce your services by yourself because you want to be anonymous. So you choose that computer to introduce you. Once that computer agrees to be your personal um, introduction point, it tells the hidden server tells the directory server, it's like, hey, please register me inside your computer, inside your directory. So if anyone wants to connect to me, let them talk to the introductory introduction point. Not talk to me directly. Talk to the introduction point, and the introduction point will talk to me. So when the client comes, an interesting client wants to connect to this web server, what does he do? He first goes to the directory server. I want to connect to this domain name dot onion. Can you please connect me to it? Tells you, okay, here's the IP address that you need to connect to. And then the second thing, the client will try to find some other computer, which is in the uh, Tor network, that's called rendezvous point. Because the client also wants to be anonymous. So the client tells which computer can be my rendezvous point, and the rendezvous point is the computer that's going to let me connect to this hidden service. Finally, you find a computer that accepts to uh, be on the hidden server, uh, to be as a rendezvous point, and then the client contacts, wants to contact this server, so he contacts the introductory point, introduction point. The uh, client will tell the introduction point, hey, I want to contact this web server, and I chose this computer to be the rendezvous point so that the server will get back to me through the rendezvous point. This will be the center of connection back and forth with me. The uh, introduction point will tell the hidden service, and the hidden service will be okay, that will, will be fine, and the hidden service will get back to the client through the rendezvous point. Now, this all happens in the beginning, when the client, only in the beginning, when the client wants to connect to the web server. After that point, all the connection happens between the client and the web server through the uh, rendezvous point. No need for the others to be involved. Just want to mention a couple things about here. First, every arrow you see in here is anonymous. And you see sometimes I put the onion uh, in there. That means all the connections are anonymous. There's three computers in between every arrow that is connecting each other anonymously. That's one. Two, the rendezvous point, uh, the client knows the, the IP address of the rendezvous point because it shows it. The hidden service, the hidden server, knows the IP address of the rendezvous point. But the rendezvous point does not know the IP address of the hidden server or the client. So both the client and the hidden service know this uh, rendezvous um, point IP address. Why is that important? Because there's an attack for that. Locating hidden services. Locating hidden services, the client itself keeps trying as an, adver as an attacker. He, the client is an attacker in here. And he keeps trying to locate this, the location of this hidden service. So the client will offer himself also to be an onion router in the network that other people can connect through it. And he keeps trying until he tries to achieve to be in this link that is between the rendezvous point and the hidden server. So he's the client, and at the same time, it happened that he's in the network, he's part of the network, th and he keeps trying until he succeeds to be part of these three computers that are between the rendezvous point and the hidden server. Once he succeeds in that, the attack is not over yet. We're still a bit far from that. So as you can see from the rendezvous point and the hidden server, there are three computers, and he wishes to be among these three as a first step for this attack. Now. Since the client knows the IP address of the rendezvous point, if he is the node 3 in the figure, then if he sees the IP address of the rendezvous point and he already has it as a client, then he knows, okay, I am node 3. But if he, know, if he sees the IP address that's coming from and going to are unknown, then he is either node 2 or node 1. What's the purpose here? Pretty obvious. The purpose is to be number 1 node number one, because if, I am not, if the attacker is node number one, then he knows the IP address of the hidden server, and he's the client, he knew the location of the hidden service. Through also some, um, 
some uh, statistical methods, he'll be able to know if he's two or one, if he's not two or one through, you know, two, for example, receive some packets before one, or one receives the replies back from the head service before two, and then he, uh, before, uh, before two, right? And then he'll be able to know where's his location in here. Once he knows he's one, he knows the IP address of the head service, and he's the client, the head and server uh, thing is, is broken. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, and I want to talk about BitTorrent. But this is all related back to Tor, because I want to come up with a conclusion. Is Tor a good tool to use while downloading bit BitTorrent? So I believe how many people are familiar with BitTorrent? Cool, the majority. So I'm going to go quickly through that. Question that we always hear, is BitTorrent legal or illegal? What do you think? It's legal. Legal, because it's a protocol. It's just a way of downloading files uh, from a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you're downloading files, instead of downloading it from a centralized server where it has, it has all the files, you're downloading it from a lot of people that has chunks of this file, and we are all sharing, downloading, uploading until I have the whole file. What, what's legal and illegal about that is the file that you're downloading, is it copyrighted? If it's copyrighted and you're getting it in an illegal way, definitely it's, it's, it's illegal. So the way BitTorrent works really quickly is that um, each file is divided into chunks, and there's a track, uh, there's a .torrent file, and this .torrent file contains the metadata of these uh, chunks of the file. It has the IP address of the tracker, which I'm going to explain in a bit, and has the uh, checksums for all the chunks of these uh, of these uh, of these chunks of this file. Now, when a client comes and wants to download a certain file, he downloads this torrent. He opens this torrent. That torrent has the IP address of the tracker. He contacts the tracker, and this tracker will tell you, "Okay, you want this file? There are these bunch of clients that are having um, some pieces of this file. You can connect to them." which these are called peers. You can connect to them and be a member of, their, of the peers, or called a swarm, member of the swarm, and start downloading from them, and let also they will, the, the pieces that you already have also will be shared with them. So it's uploading, downloading process. These, uh, the, the computers that are part of the swarm are called peers. And those, um, and those uh, peers, those computers that have the whole file, 100% of the file, are called uh, seeders. And those who have part of the file are called leachers. I'm just introducing to this some terminologies because we're going to use them later on. So um, when the client wants to download, he has to, to, sh to download from this, from this swarm. The tracker will tell him this is the IP addresses of these uh, computers. Start sharing your IP address with them and upload and download. Of course, there's risk of sharing because there are a lot of spyware viruses in there and, and, and things might be tricky because it's all peer-to-peer, -peer. you are not downloading from a trusted server and stuff like that. Now, quickly again, what is the uh, BitTorrent algorithm? Um, after you, um, after the, 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 the tracker publishes the list of available peers so you can connect to and download to them, there are two main uh, algorithms that are almost treated in every BitTorrent uh, protocol. The Redis first algorithm which is the file is a bunch of, 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 of chunks that you need to download, okay? The tracker, the, the protocol makes sure that you download the, rare, the rarest pieces first. Why? For the purpose of having the most copies of, of all the chunks available for everybody. The other um, algorithm is called chalk algorithm, which is tit for tat. This to, pro, to, to avoid people uh, to avoid these uh, clients or the peers from just downloading. Some people just want to download, don't want to upload. This algorithm will, 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 will stop you from that, will eliminate you from that. If you want to download, you need to upload. Um, there's two kind of algorithms in here, regular unchoked and optimistic unchoked. Um, the regular unchoked is every 10 seconds, it will pick the fastest three peers that ca I can connect to and I can let them uh, share with them some uh, some chunks of the file. And the optimistic unchart, it says like, hey, there's these new people who just came in and they don't have anything to share, so 
how can we get them started with some chunks? So every 30 seconds, it picks a random um, peer that, that, that just started or has a slow connection or whatever and give it some data. Now, here's the connection with Tor. We know what Tor is. We know what BitTorrent is. Is, is it safe to use Tor on BitTorrent? In other words, if I use Tor on BitTorrent, am I anonymous? Here's three slides that will, sh will answer this question. First, of course, the user hopes to download BitTorrent and his IP address is hidden. But some BitTorrent uh, clients, uh, like uTorrent, for example, will connect to the tracker using UDP. And remember, in the beginning when I talked about Tor, I said that Tor does Tor support only TCP and not UDP. So what this BitTorrent client is going to do is one of two. Either report an error to the user, oh, sorry, I cannot uh, connect you because TCP, UDP, some average user will be confused and he will not know what's going on. But the Tor client doesn't do that, and it will let go, connect you to the tracker through UDP. And hey, through UDP, that means Tor did not cover you, did not hide your IP address, so you're connected to the tracker. Through UDP, the, I, the real IP address is there. So this is a problem. The problem gets worse. Some clients request your, uh, your IP address. Tor will be doing its job. It will take your IP address, put it on three layers of encryption, and send it. The first one will unwrap, the second one will unwrap, the third one will unwrap the last layer of the onion, and then you give it your IP address. So Tor is doing its job here, but in reality what it's sending is the IP address that you're trying, that's the purpose of, the, of Tor in the first place. So, so there's definitely uh, something that not users, anonymous users wish to have. Now, the tracker has your real IP address. It connects you to the other peers. And the peers, if there's one attacker peer who wants to take your data, <laughs> sorry, he wants to know who are you, who's the IP addresses, he will ask the tracker, give me the IP address of the user having this port. All the peers know your port. And BitTorrent have a wide range of ports. So once it know one of the ports, okay, it's very unlikely for two users to have the same port. It might happen, but very unlikely because BitTorrent gives you a wide range of ports. So if the peer, if the attacker knows your port, he will take, tell the tracker, what is the IP, uh, IP address corresponding to this uh, port? It, will, it can give it to it, and that's your real IP address. So now even the peers know your real IP address. Things get a little bit worse. Imagine you're using all this approach. You're connecting uh, uh, BitTorrent through Tor, and at the same time, you're connecting two other websites okay, through exit nodes. Now, Tor shared the circuit. That three nodes we saw, that three onion routers, is used for BitTorrent and could be shared with other, uh, with other um, ports like like HTTP port, the port 80. So you can, you can use these circuits for multiple uh, reasons, for multiple connections. So if you're connecting to a website through that circuit, and the same time you're connected through Tor uh, through the same circuit, the, people, the, the web server, if he looks at, at your traffic and match it with the traffic of the BitTorrent, he will know that, hey, this is the same IP address, same pattern. It's called, called user profiling. This is, this is the profile that's connecting to BitTorrent, and this is the same uh, profile that's connected to my web server. Since BitTorrent, since through BitTorrent I was able to get your IP address, now I'm able to get your, your, since the user profile matches, I'm able to know the IP address of the, um, of the client that's connecting to this website. So not only your traffic on BitTorrent didn't get anonymous anymore, also your traffic to that website didn't, uh, is not anonymous anymore because of the lack of, of uh, support to BitTorrent. So, what's going on here? Is, is the internet now, how lucky are we if we are really anonymous? Is, is anonymity, uh, can you guarantee anonymity 100%? Is it a matter of design? 
of the anonymous networks or it's a matter of um, of uh, of luck our privacy is definitely a fundamental right uh, we need to be aware of what are we using on the internet what are we what data are we sending what data are we receiving we need to be aware to what are we connecting to um, we all have smartphones and we know that in our smartphones have a lot of sensitive data contacts uh, passwords um, emails etc is this data safe is this data going somewhere is the use of anonymous networks this solution if I use anonymous networks anonymous networks and encryption is that the ultimate solution um, this definitely helps there's a lot of attacks there's a lot of uh, updates and protection for these attacks and defenses against these attacks but the key word for all of this also gets back to you to be smart when you're using the internet and uh, be smart what data you send uh, be careful who you're connected to and always keep in mind that stuff can be unsecure and uh, uh, try to be really uh, smart and warn about all your traffic that you do over the internet um, that comes to the end of my talk I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to take questions uh, from you yeah so um, you had a slide with, where you actually explained how the traffic returns from the web server to the client yes um, so my question was, why why do you still need to encrypt the multiple layers? I mean, Node 3 just encrypts it, or rather the router 3 just encrypts it, and on its way back, the router 2 or the router 1 cannot decrypt it anyway. Okay. So the client, I, I mean, you, you just, you're just reducing the, you know, the, uh, the, the, C, uh, the utilization, that's all. Right. So, so your question is basically, why I'm, on the on the way from the client to the web server, why I'm decrypting and then encrypting on the way back? As in from the client to the web server, it makes sense. You okay. Three layers, but on the return path, you can just have OR three encrypted and OR two and OR one just pass it. It it, it need not encrypt. Right. You know, on its own. What if the adversity is OR three? That that would be a problem in either case, isn't it? I mean, on the, on the way in as well. Yeah. If, if the adversary is three, then he'll get the information either way, because he's decrypting the packet from the other end. And the last. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So OR three does not know where to send it. He knows only OR two. Okay? okay. If it's in the clear, then you're saying OR three will be able to know where to send it back to the uh, OR, to the client. Right. So imagine the situation if OR1 is the attacker. OR1 does not know the key of OR3. And all that OR3 knows is its own key that is exchanged with the client, and it knows the, only the IP address of OR2 and the web server. So you're leaking some pieces of information here, because if it doesn't do the encryption, it will not know to where to forward it. Remember, when the client sends it to OR1, and OR1 forwarded to OR2, OR1 did not know about OR2 until it unwrapped and decrypted and know, oh, here's the IP address, now I know to where to send it. But before the decryption or unwrapping, it didn't know where to go. And, and, and that's, that's the part where, where we need it also on the way back. It needs to encrypt it in order to, uh, the key is not shared, the key, the, if, if, if the attacker is one of these three, not, to, to, to be still protected, way down and the way up. So, so the key mapping is actually static but, uh, for each router? Not static, it's a it's metric. Once, once, once the client connects to the directory server, um, once the client connects to the directory server, it ex uh, the client will know all these three computers and will exchange keys up to, uh, with everyone. So if another client connects, he will exchange different, different three keys, of course. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Hey, you said that like the web server in that case knows the IP address of OR3 because it's the exit point. So the, the web server will think that the packets coming from the client are coming from OR3. So if I'm in case of where the client is using the Tor network for malicious purposes, so yes. is, is OR3 taking like legal responsibility for the actions of someone else towards the web server? True. So, good question. If, if somebody is downloading illegal content, 
okay? Copyrighted content, this is illegal, we shouldn't be doing that. If the client is doing that, and, and, and the law enforcement, law enforcement is looking at who is downloading this illegal content, they will know that it's the third, uh, third uh, OR, right? So who's in trouble now? The third OR and not the client, if, if you were successful in this, all this connection. Um, that's why a lot of people, when they offer their computers to be part of the uh, Tor network, sometimes they choose not to be an exit relay, which is not to be OR3. Here, some people volunteer their computers to be uh, part of the Tor network, but either to be OR1 and OR2. So when, um, when I talked to Roger Dingledine, the, uh, the one who uh, uh, invented Tor with other, um, with other uh, people, he told me, I told him, what would you like from people to do? Volunteer their computers to, um, to be uh, bridges? Or, or what, what do you prefer? He was like, I need OR3s. There's a lot of people volunteering their computers to be OR1 but not, and OR2, but not OR3s. And we need OR3s. We need exit relays. Because there are only a few exit relays. Because as you said, as you brought it up, that people are concerned about the content that, that that people are downloading through their computers and they don't want to face any illegal um, cases. So that's what's happening. There's, there's a few exit nodes um, that, that, that are available nowadays and that's what they kind of encourage to have more computers. But definitely it's risky. Yes, sir. Since it's risky, why, why would you like, choose to be an exit next node? Um, I mean, some people do it for research purposes. It's definitely risky. You can put your own control in that. But um, we've heard and read about some cases. And, um, and actually, when I talked to Roger again about this, he mentioned to me that there are some forms that if you were sued or something, you can go and, and fill up, explain to the court that, hey, I'm an exit node. I'm really not the one who did this. But I, I really not have too much knowledge about the, uh, how things happen in the court and stuff like that. But he mentioned it to me that there are some cases like that and there are some forms if you explain to the court and stuff like that. But I'm not sure about it. But it's available on the torproject.org website about these cases. And, uh, and, um, and this definitely cases happened. And I don't know what's, what's the judge uh, decisions in these uh, cases or not. Yes. I have another question. Is the directory server centralized or is it distributed? Uh, they made it distributed. It was centralized and they made it distributed because of the denial of service attacks. Some people uh, were attacking the directory servers. Some people were um, uh, faking directory servers and they're telling like, okay, this is, this is the only Tor uh, Onion routers that are available and they are all malicious. So they made it distributed and they made them more secure. So nowadays it's distributed. Is there any chance where you've looked at, uh, you know, on, on the web server side, um, the DNS mapping to the Tor request? Because the DNS comes through, majority of the DNS request comes through a UDP. So one of the servers of the web server will be offering the DNS response, which is on UDP and it should be coming through an open channel. But your actual, let's say, a web server request is coming to TCP through Tor. So, you know, when you map these two, you kind of have an idea of, you know, who the user is. Um. You're not talking about hidden services, right? No, no, no. Okay. Generally. So, generally so you're saying when the client connects to a web server, who's doing the DNS? No, as in, as in the web, one of the servers on the web server side, a DNS server on the web server side okay. is actually doing the DNS response. Okay. So, but this has to go out of channel. Okay. Because it's, it's on UDP. Is it on UDP? Yeah. Yes. So Tor tries to force or to convert the UDP traffic into TCP, but if it fails, it comes back to the application. Okay. It comes back to the application by either reporting an error to you or let it go, like it happened with the BitTorrent. That's the big thing in BitTorrent. So, so what the Tor people really wish that tell, like what's the solution? The solution is to design or the developers to fix of BitTorrent to fix their, their applications. And many applications, like the example you mentioned, many applications like that. Many applications have been designed and not having anonymity in mind, okay? And just they want the user or the, the customer to have a wonderful experience. If, if connect to TCP, connect to UDP, we don't care. We want you to have a fast connection and you have everything. But if you have anonymity in mind, 
and you know that you want your application to be really strong in, uh, in, uh, in anonymity for Tor, let's say, for this example, you can use design your application to work only uh, on TCP. So to answer your question again, it's all based on how this is, is implemented, developed. Is it based on UDP, based on TCP? Of course, there's a lot of anonymous networks that support both. There's other on, based on VPN, and as I mentioned in, 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 uh, in one of the slides, but there's a lot more, and we, I just discussed Tor today because it's more popular, and uh, a lot of people are doing research on it, and it's quite interesting to know it. Um, um, definitely, it's a good thing if you guys go home and try it and see how it works, again, look at your IP addresses and everything, see how they are changing. And uh, it would be a good experience if you have also ideas for research in it. And uh, my email address is on the first slide. Um, feel free to contact me. I've done a lot of research in that. And I'm more than excited to, to discuss it with you guys and uh, uh, probably uh, discuss some research ideas about that. Let's thank you all. All right, thank you.